All right, hello everyone, Simon here, and welcome back to our ArcMine 100 series where we are learning architectural concepts through Minecraft. So this is the fifth lecture and it is going to be light and shadow. It says right there, light and shadow. So before we uh, get into the fun stuff, let get, let's uh, get the boring stuff out of the way. So here's some lighting terminology that you might want to become familiar with. So a candela is a measure of luminous intensity or the apparent brightness of a light source from a particular direction. And one candela is roughly the brightness of a candle as visible to the human eye. I don't know if that makes sense or not. It probably doesn't. So it's a, a measure of the apparent brightness. So how bright a light source appears to you. So if you kind of look at a light bulb or you look at a candle, one candle it, it, that that brightness is one candela. That's how bright that thing is, or approximately. And you know, light bulbs are, are brighter than candles, and they're not. Don't don't look in the sun too much. But the sun is you know even brighter than light bulbs. So how how bright something appears to you is is measured in candelas. Although keep in mind that this is visible light, so as visible to the human eye. So if you you know, if you're measuring the infrared heat or something, or you're measuring X-rays or something, then it's then we're not talking about candelas. The candela unit refers specifically to how the human eye perceives light, and so do, so do these other units here. So the next one is lumen, which measures luminous flux, or the total amount of visible light emitted from a particular source. And one lumen is defined as one candela per steradian. And uh, there's four pi the radians in a sphere, if you know your math. So, so luminous flux is how much visible light is coming out of a source. So there's a difference there between a lumen and a candela. A candela is how bright it appears to your eye at any at any kind of point in time. So, you know, and in any particular direction at any particular point in time, one candela is about one candle's brightness. But a lumen is one candela per steradian, so it's, it measures the visible light energy coming out of the source, right? So, you know, one is what your eye sees, the other one is how much energy is coming out, which is not the same thing because you imagine that the candle would be emitting light in all directions. So what you see is one candela, but it's also one candela to your friend who might be on the other side of the room looking at the candle from a different angle the light that your friend is seeing is not the same light that you are seeing because you are seeing a different portion of that light. So lumen measures the light coming out, whereas candela measures the light going into your eye. And then the last unit there that we want to talk about is lux, which is luminous, lux, luminous flux per area, or how brightly lit a surface is. And one lux equals one lumen per square meter. So this is how much light is hitting a surface. And one lux is, if, if there's one lumen per square meter of surface, then that's one lux. So, candela is how bright a light source appears to your eye. Lumen is how much light energy is coming from a light source. Lux is how much light energy is hitting a surface. So these are three interrelated but different things. And really, the lux is the one that we are most interested in, I think. Although lumens are also, also interesting. Lux is the, is the thing that we usually talk about because we're talking about, well, how bright is this table? Or, you know, how bright is that wall? That's, that's what Lux is. So if we kind of look at some typical illuminance values, uh, a full moon on a clear night is about 0.26 to 1 Lux. So if it's like a clear night and there's a full moon in the sky and there's no other light around you, like you're out in the wilderness and there's a full moon out, then the, the, the amount of light you see on the ground is about one lux. So it's, it's not very much, in fact, it's very, very little light. And yet, you know, if it is a full moon, you can see relatively well. I mean, you can usually kind of see well enough to walk around and, and not trip over yourself. So, you know, one lux is not much light, but it's enough to see things by. 0.26 is probably a bit dark, but you can still kind of see things. So your, your eye is able to see things even in very low light conditions, right? Even in the middle of the night, out in the middle of nowhere if there's a full moon out. So a typical family living room with lights on at night is about 50 lux. 
So, you know, 50 times as much light energy. So imagine you have kind of one light bulb in a living room. That's about 50 lux. This is kind of, these are rough kind of numbers, right? Because, you know, everyone has a different size family room. Maybe your lights are brighter than my lights. So about 50 lux is, you know, a, a typical kind of home at night. Uh, the typical office building hallway or toilet is about 80 lux. Again, you know, without any external light coming in the windows, just kind of maybe nighttime or if it's kind of really indoors, then, you know, office building toilets might be 80 lux. The typical office lighting on office work surfaces is between 350 to 500 lux. Now, a work surface basically is a table. So if you are in an office building and, and you're, you're working there, then your table, or maybe even at school, probably should be schools as well. So if you're kind of in a university lecture hall, actually not a lecture hall, because usually they dim the lights for the lectures. But <laughs> you know, if you're kind of in an office building or, or a library, probably a library is a good, good example, then you know, your, your books and your pages should be illuminate, illuminated to about 350 or about 300 to 500 lux. And that is the standard amount of light that is recommended for reading and writing. So you can see kind of words clearly on a page. That's how much light you need. Uh, I mean, you don't really need that much light this to read, but that that's kind of that's comfortable reading, or that's kind of reliable enough light that you can kind of read clearly. Uh, in comparison, outdoors on an overcast day, so there's kind of sun, or there's there's no sun visible. It's just kind of clouds in the entire sky. That's 1,000 lux outdoors. So even when it's clouds covering the entire sky, the sun still manages to put enough light through the clouds to light the ground to 1,000 lux. That's, that's brighter than you know an office building table. That's, as, that's about as bright as a television studio. And you know, like, I don't know if you know, but television studios, like, you know, they have really bright lights to make sure that all the actors or, or the, what, whoever it is that's on camera is seen clearly by the camera. So television studios are really brightly lit with kind of really kind of powerful lights. And that's a thousand lux, and that's about at the same as an overcast day that's outdoors. Uh, a clear day in direct sunlight, so no clouds, the sun is just kind of blasting straight down onto the ground. You get up to a hundred thousand lux on the ground in full sunlight. That is probably near the equator. Uh, because, you know, if you're further away from the equator, then you're at an angle to the sun and all that, so there's less sun per square area or whatever it is. So if you're near the equator, I'm, I'm kind of not explaining that properly. I guess I don't have to. If you're interested, then look up kind of solar irradiation on the Earth and kind of maybe look it up on Wikipedia. But this just, you know, it's, it's anywhere between 32,000 to 100,000 lux is direct sunlight on a clear day. If you live near the equator, it's more like 100,000 lux. If you live in Norway or something, then I guess it's more like 32,000 lux. Um, yeah, and if you just look at those numbers, so full moon on a clear night is 1 lux. Full sunlight is about 100,000 lux. That's a huge difference in how much light there is. That's like, what, 100,000 times as much light as it is at nighttime. And people can see even without the moon sometimes. Like, you, know, you can't see very much. But if your eyes are adjusted to the darkness, you can still see things. Um, math. So this is this diagram illustrates the inverse square law. Uh, light sources are measured in lumens, lit surfaces, and lux. We kind of went through that already. And lumens is how much energy is coming out of a light source, and lux is how much light energy is hitting a surface. So lights from point sources follow the inverse square law. What is the inverse square law? As the distance between the light source and the surface increases, the illuminance of the surface decreases by the square of the distance. What does that mean? So if if you get one lumen at one meter, uh, no, 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 I mean, if you have four lumens at one meter, then you get one lumen at two meters. So it's a square, two meters, the square, inverse square, two meters, two squared is four. Does that make sense? The reason that is, is because, you know, basically, if you imagine you have a point source of light, so like a light bulb or a candle or the sun, but you know, if you have a candle, then the light is radiating outwards, imagine in a sphere. So as, the, as you get further away from the candle, the sphere increases. 
and the sphere increases as as a surface area versus the linear distance, which means that it is it is a square. Like the as you increase the distance from the from the candle linearly, the amount of area of that sphere is increasing by the square of that distance. So the amount of light hitting per unit area of that of that sphere on the inside is decreasing by the square of the distance. I don't know if that makes sense to you guys. Maybe try and find some diagram. But this is the diagram basically. You know, as you this is this is kind of radius, one radius, two radius and three radius. At one radius, you know, you have one unit square and you have all that light hitting one unit square. But as you get to two radius, that amount of light is hitting four radius, uh, four squares. So, and then as you get to three radius, that amount of light is hitting nine squares. So, you know, as you spread out the light over more squares, it means that the amount of light hitting each square is less, right? So, if if you don't, if you kind of can't get your head around the math, basically. Illuminance decreases rapidly with increasing distance. So as you move away from the light source, the amount of light energy hitting the surface very rapidly decreases. And that's something that you have to kind of keep in mind. Maybe if you have a light bulb in your room, just kind of go right up close to the light bulb and see how much light there is, and then go to the other side of the room and see how much light there is. It, it decreases quite rapidly. Uh, human perception of brightness. So back to our biology and our eyes. The human eye can function in a wide range of light levels, the brightest being some one billion times brighter than the darkest. So the, the, the dimmest thing or the darkest thing that we can see versus the brightest thing we can see, the brightest thing is about a billion times brighter than the darkest thing that we can possibly see. However, at any one time, the eye can sense a contrast ratio of one in a thousand, which means at any one point in time, the brightest thing you can see is one thousand times brighter than the darkest thing you can see. So how, how is it a billion and then a thousand? The thing is, the human eye adapts to bright conditions or to dark conditions. So for a human eye to adapt from the brightest conditions to the darkest conditions, it takes about half an hour, whereas from dark to light, it takes about five minutes. And if you've kind of ever been, like, maybe you've kind of watched the movie during the day and then kind of walked out into the daylight, or, you know, if you walk kind of from, from outdoors to a really dark room, or even at night, you just kind of turn off the lights, you'll notice that after some time, your eyes adjust to the darkness or to the brightness. So if you, if you walk out of the cinema, then, you know, it takes a while before your eyes adapt to the brightness. And, and conversely, if you kind of turn out the, the lights at night, it takes a while before your eyes adapt to the, to the darkness. And what was happening is that the, uh, your pupil ch is changing size and the chemicals on the retina of your eye is also just kind of changing so that, you know, you are, you're adapted thing, your eye kind of adapts to different light levels to allow you to be able to see both, you know, in very light conditions and very dark conditions, but not at the same time. It takes time for your eye to adjust. Um, so going on to architecture, natural light in architecture is sometimes used for quite dramatic effects, probably uh, best exemplified by Gothic cathedrals. The way the uh, Gothic cathedral works is that the stained glass windows or the... the um, the altar is always at the eastern end of the cathedral, and the reason that is is because, you know, during morning mass, the sun is rising in the east, and so when you're sitting in the pew, it's kind of facing the altar, the sun is right behind the altar, kind of blasting in through the stained glass onto you, so it's like you're bathed in that light, and you know, in terms of kind of the the, the narrative and the and the kind of the, the figurative idea is that, you know, the, the light of God is kind of washing over you. you know, that, that's the idea. So you, you're supposed to be kind of impressed by this kind of bright light behind this massive window. And if the sun is bright enough, like, the, the architecture will just dissolve because your, your eyes can't, you know, handle the, the direct sunlight and so it will look like this thing is just, this building is just kind of dissolving into colored lights because there's kind of stained glass everywhere. And 
And it's quite impressive. It is quite impressive. And that's kind of using natural light for dramatic effect is when you, you know, when you're kind of facing into the sun and maybe, you know, the choir is singing or something and there's kind of this music and then there's a light coming in. It's just, it was a pretty good show. If you're interested, maybe go to church one day and have a look at that. But it has to be morning church and the church has to be a proper church that's aligned to the east. Otherwise, you don't get the effect. Most cathedrals are aligned, are aligned so that, you know, the, uh, the altar is to the east. Uh, another example is the Pantheon in Rome. This is the interior. Unfortunately, the Pantheon is quite difficult to photograph because it's like a circular building and it's large and, and you, there's nowhere to stand where you can kind of just photograph the entire room unless you have some sort of like a fisheye lens or something. Anyway, so it's very difficult to capture this space with a camera. You kind of have to go there and look all around you to kind of get a sense of the space. But it has no windows except for this one oculus at the top of the domed roof. And so what happens is as the sun kind of arcs across the sky, you, the light kind of streams in through the oculus and it kind of creates a spot of light in the building. And as the sun moves across the sky, the spot of light is just slowly moving across the space in the interior. And it's, it's pretty impressive too. So it's like, you know, this kind of this beam of light blasting in. Um, unfortunately, the we don't quite know what the Pantheon looked like back in the uh, in the Roman times. So the Pantheon was built by the Romans, but over time it was converted into a Christian church and there's kind of in, uh, renovations in, in the interior and they change things around. So we don't really know exactly what it looked like in the past, but it could be that this sunlight thing was a... maybe they kind of put statues or various important you know, artifacts in the path of the sunlight so that, you know, during the day the, the light will highlight different parts of the interior of the Pantheon. We're not sure, but that, that's one possible kind of arrangement of the, of the kind of a, of the building, of the temple. It used to be a temple to all the gods. That's why it's called the Pantheon. Pantheon means all the gods. So it used to be a temple that was dedicated to the entire Pantheon of Roman gods. But we, we don't know what it was like back in the Roman times, unfortunately. But it's very interesting that this kind of this spotlight sort of effect tracks across the uh, the building interior, you know, throughout the day. Very impressive, but very difficult to photograph. Unfortunately, you have to be there to really experience it. Uh, this is a picture of the Shikokumura Gallery in Japan by Tadao Ando. Tadao Ando does this sort of thing a lot, and again, this is not easy to photograph. Probably should um, should be brighter than this, maybe. But what he does is he uses concrete and light a lot. He's very famous for his creative use of natural light, and also of, of the immaculate white concrete. Because when you have white light streaming in, you know, he uses the, the white concrete just as a backdrop for the light. And so then here in this in this example, there's like there's there's gaps at the edge of the ceiling. So there's there's windows at the top of the wall. So it's like you're in this kind of roughly oval, you're in this kind of oval well, and then there's a cap at the top, but then at the edge of the cap, there's light streaming in, and so it's kind of like um I don't know if you've guys seen the movie The Ring. <laughs> it's kind of like the ring. <laughs> If you haven't seen it, maybe you you should look it up, The Ring, the movie. Uh, if you have seen it, then you know what I mean. So the light kind of just streams in at the edge of, of the walls at the top, which is kind of interesting. And again, you know, natural light is, because of how bright the sun is, it's it's kind of easy to, to make really dramatic effects using sunlight because it's like this massive light source. And so whatever shape you put in the way of the sun, it will cast interesting shadows and have interesting effects all over the place. I mean, it's not that easy, but it's, it's relatively easy to use sunlight for these effects. Uh, in contrast to natural sunlight, artificial lighting in architecture for most of human history has been rather sad. Uh, because for most of human history, we've used things like candles, lamps, braziers, fireplaces. Like We have to use fire. And the problem with especially candles and oil lamps is that they were really, really dim and really, really inefficient. 
most of the energy from a candle is heat. It's not even visible light. So you're burning this thing away, and it's not even kind of lighting very much. Most of it is just kind of smoke and heat, which is not useful. And it's also high maintenance because, you know, if you see in this picture here, there's literally hundreds of candles. And if you just look at the ceiling here, it's complete shadow. So you have like hundreds of candles on these chandeliers, and there's hardly any light in this space. That's how bad candles are. They don't give off any sort of light. So for, for most of human history, it was very difficult to have any meaningful light inside buildings at night. I mean, you could have a candle, you could see things, but you couldn't really read by the candle light because it's so dim, you can hardly see anything. And also the open flames were a significant risk to any wooden and timber buildings and your, all your furniture and books. And you know, you, every so often the city would burn down because somebody set their house on fire. And so it was kind of inconvenient and it was really, really, really dim and just not, not good. It was similar to me. You spend all this time lighting hundreds of candles and you still can barely see anything. That's basically how it was when there was candles. Uh, although, you know, there were festivals, especially in China and in kind of, I guess, in the Chinese tradition, there, there are a number of lantern festivals. Perhaps the most uh, celebrated is the Mid-Autumn Festival here in Singapore, which is the, the Chinese diaspora. Um, what would happen was that everyone would kind of go out into the streets and they would bring a, bring a lantern with them and it would be a big party and everybody would have fun. And, you know, by, by having everybody come out and everybody bring their own lantern, they could light the whole city and then you could have a, have a night festival. Whereas if, if, kind of, if you didn't get people to bring their lanterns with them, then it'd be too dark to do anything. So, <laughs> but then, you know, I mean, it was, it was kind of, it was fun. And it was kind of also kind of beautiful because you had all these lanterns everywhere and then everyone was kind of enjoying themselves at night. But you needed the whole city to light these lanterns and come together in order to have any meaningful amount of light. Uh, lantern festivals still happen today, but the great majority, almost all of them, are electric lights because candles are crap and nobody wants to deal with candles and their nonsense anymore. And also, it's a massive fire risk. Imagine if there's like hundreds of lanterns, hundreds of paper lanterns with fire inside them. So you can imagine the kind of disasters that can happen if, if you know any of them caught fire. Also, in, in European cities, there used to be like a in some countries, it used to be required that you would have to put a lantern out at night out of your front door. So this was back before they had street lighting. So there weren't kind of public street lighting, but there is a real benefit to having some light out at night to, you know, for crime deterrence so that you can kind of see things. You know, if somebody tried to steal your neighbor's stuff, you can kind of see the thieves. So having, having light out in the street is actually quite useful, but you know they didn't have street lighting, and so there was a requirement for people to put lamps out in front of their door at night. Um, they, the lights probably didn't last the entire night, or maybe they did. I don't know, but it was it was pretty haphazard. You know, it wasn't really uh, all that reliable. So here, this is a picture of a gas lamp. So gas lighting was invented in the 1800s, used, first using gasified coal and then later using natural gas. So gas lighting was a huge, huge improvement from the oil lamps and the candles because gas fuels, they, like it burned, it, it burned better and, so it, like it, and it burned more efficiently and so it could produce much brighter lights. And also gas could be piped into businesses and homes because you know, it's, it's a gas. So you kind of set up this pipe network and you just kind of pump gas into, into houses. And so with the invention of gas lighting, for the first time, factories and businesses could operate 24 hours a day because it was, these things were actually bright enough that you can work under the light. Whereas, you know, with candles, you can kind of see things, but you can't really read. And you, kind of, you can't do intricate work. Whereas suddenly, with, with kind of the invention of gas lamps, there was enough light that you can work at night, and and then people could kind of live and work 24 hours a day, which was uh, quite innovative back then. And also, large-scale outdoor street lighting became viable. So instead of asking people to hang their own lamps out at night, 
people, they could just kind of set up lamps in the streets and pump gas into them. And, and you had lit streets at night. You know, the first lit streets were in the big cities of the world, like Paris and London. And it was kind of this amazing thing where you could walk around at night and there's enough light to see things. It was so amazing. I mean, it's not that amazing now. You know, almost every modern city, every developed city is, has, has lights. But it was incredible back then and people were so impressed. Uh, they were kind of lamplighters. So this guy is a lamplighter in Sweden, all the way in 1953. And this is like, that's one of the last lamplighters. So at first, somebody had to go around each lamp to light them every night. Uh, but later on, they, they invented, you know, better lamps that lit themselves. Once you kind of pump gas in, they would start lighting themselves. So, you know, as technology advanced, things became more, more and more convenient. And the lamps also became better. Uh, electric lighting was invented in the early 1800s, but it wasn't commercially viable until the 1880s design by Thomas Edison for the incandescent light bulb. The problem was like it's easy to create a little bit of light with electricity, but having a light bulb that lasts a long time and produced a lot of light wasn't really a viable thing until Thomas Edison kind of figured it out and then made a light bulb that was both bright enough and long-lasting enough to be worth kind of installing. And once that happened, it, the, light, the electric light is even more convenient than gas lighting, and it's safer too, because gas lighting is it's still a fire. You, know, you, can, you can still set your home on fire with the gas light. With, whereas with an electric light, it's very, very unlikely that you can set your house on fire. Although you can still do it like if you're really not careful. But it's, it's much harder to kind of burn your house down with an electric light. Um, Early incandescent light, and even though all incandescent lights are remarkably inefficient, like more than 97% of the energy coming out of an incandescent light bulb is heat. It's not even light. So three percent, like less than three percent of the energy you put into an incandescent light bulb is is actual light. The rest of it is heat. So we don't. Some countries don't like they've they've started banning incandescent light bulbs just because of how of how inefficient they are. So these days we have fluorescent lamps and LEDs. LEDs uh, or light everything diodes are proving to be quite uh, efficient and quite long lasting. So the the new kind of types of lights, it's mostly LEDs, are going to be. Um, I think they're going to be taking over from even fluorescent lights in the near future, just because of how good they are. Sodium vapor lamps are used or were used a lot in street lighting. I think they still are. They're very efficient. They give up a lot of light for the amount of energy you put in. But the problem with um, sodium vapor lamps, this is like a, it's a really bad photo of a low pressure sodium vapor street light. So the low pressure sodium lights were, like I think they still are the most efficient type of light in the world available in terms of you know converting electricity to light. But it is a very, very poor quality of light. It's only like a very narrow spectrum of orange light. If you remember the previous uh, lecture on colors, like different different colors of light is different frequencies of electromagnetic radiation, right? And to get white light, you need a full spectrum of light to get white. Whereas the low pressure sodium, it doesn't have any sort of spectrum. It has one kind of frequency of orange light. And so if you light a space with this lamp, everything looks orange because that's the only light you have coming out of this lamp. Like there's no reds, there's no greens, there's no blues, it's, it's just orange. So even though it was very efficient, there was absolutely no colors. And um, for quite a while, it was used very widely as street lamps because they were so efficient. And and it, they, it's why you know there's a, there's a certain association of orange, of this orange glow with nighttime cityscapes. Uh, if you've played Deus Ex Human Revolution and you wonder why everything is orange or why everything is yellow, it's because of the low-pressure sodium vapor lamp. Because these lamps, which were used until quite recently, just made everything look yellow. And that's how cities really did look like. These days, uh, high-pressure sodium lamps and other types of lamps are becoming more frequently used because they just they, they actually give you color, as so you can see colors, and not just orange. Um, but the low pressure sodiums are still the most efficient. But efficient is not the only thing because if you can't see colors, it's actually quite dangerous. 
let's say you're driving and you can't see the colors, it's actually quite dangerous because like you can't can't see traffic lights and you can't see other things as well. So they've they've mostly kind of stopped using these. Or maybe maybe in some parts of the world they still do use them. Uh, artificial lighting and architecture. So moving on to buildings. Um, for the most part, artificial lighting in architecture is utilitarian. I mean, if you think about lighting in buildings, mostly it's, it's to actually provide light. You know, you have light to, to kind of light your room, light your office, light your schools. Decorative lighting is rare, although on, on some landmarks you would see them. So this picture here is of the Empire State Building. And uh, originally the Empire State Building had metal halide floodlights. So that's another type of light that's very bright. Or not very efficient, but metal halide lights are very bright, with uh, nine kind of colored filters on it. So it, there were kind of nine, nine different colors available. So they could kind of light the top of the Empire State Building in different colors. And you know they would light them during Christmas, for example. Here uh, we have kind of red and green patterns for Christmas, and then maybe on uh, Independence Day in the, in the United States they would be kind of red and white, maybe. So it, it's purely decorative, and it's kind of fun. Uh, but they recently converted the Empire State Building decorative lights to LEDs. So instead of the nine available colors, now they can produce a, you know any variety of 18 million different colors. And they can also kind of have them flicker and, and, and change in patterns as well. So LEDs are much, 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 much more versatile than the metal halide floodlights, and also lower maintenance more energy efficient, so everything about LEDs is better than metal halides. So that's that's one example of decorative lighting. Uh, another example here is the Tower of Winds in Yokohama, Japan by Toyo Ito. Toyo Ito is an interesting architect. He, um, he does like high technology a lot. In this case, he's put colored lights into a ventilation tower. This is Basically, a ventilation system for an underground shopping center, but he's, he's got it's got this perforated metal sheeting on the exterior, and then colored lights on the interior, and he's linked the lights to wind and sound sensors around the building, and so as, as the wind blows and as you know as, as kind of the traffic noise changes, the lights in the building would will change as well, so you know as we can't see it here because this is a still photo, but but the, the the building is basically always kind of changing and, and, and kind of flickering and and moving and changing color. It's not really moving, but the colors are moving around. So it's one of these kind of it's almost like a like a decorative moving sculpture, right? It's not. I mean, functionally, it's just a cooling tower, but but it's a very interesting effect. Unfortunately, we can't see the video of it, or we, we don't have a video of it here. Maybe you can look it up on the internet or something. But it's a uh, you know it's an interesting use of lighting, mostly for decorative purposes. In fact, purely for decorative purposes. Looks good though. Uh, slightly less purely artistic and more kind of commercial in nature. You might see a lot of uh, neon signs in certain parts of the world. I think most famously we have Times Square in New York, Shinjuku in Tokyo, the Las Vegas Strip, and here this is Portland Street in Hong Kong. Where you know artificial light, artificial lighting is used extensively for marketing purposes. You guys probably can't see what's going on here. If you want this translation, there's like restaurants. There's a KFC. You can see that down at the bottom left, and then there's karaoke clubs, and uh, and uh, hotels, and there's a fashion store and other things. So this is this is a really kind of crowded. You know, when 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 the signs get this crowded, you gotta wonder if anybody can actually see any signs anymore. I guess they can, but it's like signs covering other signs. Not sure if, if it's effective advertising anymore when you get to, get to this stage. But Times Square is also interesting. Like there's kind of massive television screens, kind of showing advertisements all the time, and it's also very brightly lit too. So yeah, artificial lighting. Mostly, mostly for purely utilitarian purposes. Sometimes for for advertising, and very rarely for pure decoration. 
Um, lighting in Minecraft deserves a bit of mention because it is unnatural and maybe unusual in some ways. So if you're not familiar with how light works in Minecraft, there are 15 light levels, a total of 15. So the brightest, brightest lit surface is 15, and then it fades to zero. You can still see things at zero, and, and, and 15 is not really that bright. So during the day, uh, if it's unobstructed and you can see the sky above you, then the, the, then the ground below you is lit at 15. Uh, torches are at light level 14, and lava and glowstone is at light level 15. And then how the light works is that for every one block you move away from the light source, the light level decreases by one. So in the picture here, we have this kind of um, cave-like arrangement. So the light is coming straight down at 15, and all the blocks in the in the in the air here is is lit 15. So outside the edge here is 15, and then at the at the ceiling also out here is 15. And then as you move inwards, because this is and from this point onwards is being covered by the by the timber there. So that's like. 14, and then 13, and then 12, and then 11, 10, 9, 8. So it kind of fades to zero once you once you cover the sky here. So those are at light level 14, and so is this. So that's 14, and then 13, and so on. It fades to zero. At the back there, there's a torch. And so then the block on the torch itself is light level 14. But as you move away from the torch, you kind of fade away to zero, and so on and so forth. So that's how light works in Minecraft. So to reiterate, anything that is directly open to the, to the sky during the day is light level 15. And then anything that's not, the further away from the sky or, or the block that's open to the sky it is, the more it fades. And it fades by one light level each block until it fades to zero. Uh, transparent blocks do not affect the light. And transparent is, uh, I mean, I put them in quotes there because it's a very specific kind of category of blocks. Glass is transparent. Fences, interestingly, are transparent. And some other things too, I think. But water is not transparent. Water reduces the light level by two. And also, if you put light, let's, let's say you kind of have, imagine you have sky, and then you have water, and then you have glass. You have a glass pool holding up the water. Then the ground underneath is no longer open to the sky, and so from the water, the water will be on the top of the water will be light level fifteen. Water reduces the light level by two blocks, so in the water will be light level twelve because it's one away from fifteen plus another two or minus another two, which is twelve. And then the block underneath the water is eleven, and then underneath that is ten, and then underneath that is nine. And so then if you kind of have a have a surface down here, it's actually not lit at all. Like you can get to light level zero down here if you have like a pool of water about 12 blocks above the ground up here, if that makes sense. Uh, finally, there's no direct shadows and no direct sunlight. In the sense that like if you see the, the sun kind of move across the sky, the sun doesn't cast a direct shadow the way you would see a shadow if you kind of walk into you know, walk outside in the sunlight, you see a shadow of yourself on the ground. That does not exist in the game. There's no direct shadows in the game. There's only skylight, and even the skylight doesn't cast shadows. The skylight only fades as you move away from the open air. So, yeah, so lighting in Minecraft is quite abstract and, and not realistic. But we're gonna we're gonna experiment with light in Minecraft anyway. But you know, as you kind of do that, you really really have to keep in mind that it's not really helping you design lighting in the real world because it's so unrealistic. But we'll do it anyway, and then we can learn a few things from it. But it's yeah, it's it's quite abstract. So the fifth exercise is the mausoleum. You see that circle there towards the uh, the top left of the city there. Your task is, given a mausoleum with no roof, design and build a roof with skylights to create interesting light conditions in the interior during the day. So let me say that again. The, the, mausoleum, the mausoleum that I give you does not have a roof. 
you want to create a roof with skylights in it in such a way that the interior of the mausoleum has interesting and dramatic lighting effects during the day. Uh, optionally, for an additional challenge, also design and build artificial lighting for night conditions, which that might be a little bit too much. I mean, I'm kind of I put that there. You don't have to do it because it might kind of get in the way of trying to deal with daylight. If you have daylight and night lights at the same time, it might be a bit difficult to deal with. But if you if you're able to do that, I'll be very impressed. Like you know, if you're able to um, have artificial lighting as well, so that it works at nighttime as well. Uh, as you do this, consider the spatial arrangement of the mausoleum. There's an entrance uh, towards the temple side, and then there's like a central axis, and then there's a focal point, and then there's side areas. It's not obvious from this drawing here, but we know in the next video as we go do this exercise, I'll show you what I mean, and then we'll kind of take a look, take a walk around the uh, interior of the mausoleum, and I'll kind of point out interesting things, or you can probably see it yourself. Uh, remember that light draws attention and reveals forms, whereas shadows hide and obscure. So if you want people to see something or pay attention to something, usually you just light it and then people will notice it. Whereas if you want to hide things, then you keep it in shadow and people can't see it anymore. Not complicated, not complicated, but have a go with that exercise. I'll do it in the next video. Here are the image licenses and that's it for this lecture. I will see you in the next video where we experiment with light.